you. Thank you. Well, that was fascinating, listening to Liv telling us about artefacts that have a history, that actually people, the producers of the artefacts were actually there to explain what they were. Otherwise, it's pretty difficult to work out what something was, what was the intention of the, the manufacturer if you can't actually speak to them. I'm not going back a couple of decades, a few decades, I'm going back centuries, millennia. So let's see how we go. Um, this, to me, by the way, is brand new. Um, it's a spin off bit of research, so I don't have much depth in it, but we'll see how we go. Okay, cinerary urns. They're um, huge pots, really big, some of them. Um, now, this is pre, uh, pre wheel, um, so they're, they're handmade um, and really quite enormous. Uh, some of them, ranging from to that. Um, they're, they tend to be found as secondary burials. They're, they're, um, a little illustration there would show they're um, found associated with other burials in mounds as a secondary burial. It was one, at one time thought there were satellites or something, there was some, but I think it was just the place that attracted people and there was a small pit dug and the, the, uh, the urn put in over um, cremated remains. Um, so, and that inversion is very important. That inversion was almost universal. Um, very significant. Uh, Timing-wise, um, this is, a, this is a, um, an event that happened in, in across the British Isles, uh, Britain and Ireland, uh, roughly the same time, for, at the early, beginning of the early Bronze Age. And there were several types of urn um, across time. There was the vase urn, the covered urn, cordoned, and finally the, the very elaborate encrusted urn um, towards the end of the, the, the phenomenon. And the encrusted ones were pretty amazing looking, some of them. Um, yeah, just one thing with the typology there. If you, if you actually look at them now, there's some debate as to whether these were specifically designed to be used as cinerary urns or they were just domestic items that were uh, just just brought in for used as a secondary uh, uh, measure but if you actually look at the base they're they're not practical they, they don't they wouldn't really sit upright um once you put any any contents into those they would fall over they would tend to topple uh, people have said well maybe they rested in pits maybe they rested in nets maybe they didn't <laughs> you know they, they, they were just designed to be um, turned upside down they were, they were made probably um, on the death of the individual for the individual, I suspect. Um, really, this, this is what I'm looking at is material culture. Um, now, it's a thing that I, I think has got slightly eclipsed. Um, the headline grabber at the minute is, and, and rightly so, because it's making some fantastic strides, is the bioarchaeology, um, the, the DNA, the ancient DNA, and the strontium isotope. Um, work that's going on is phenomenal, phenomenal. Um, with it, we can we, we, we can bring people back to life, sort of. Um, we can create images, and this this really does capture the public's imagination. It's fabulous, especially if you get a well done one like this. Um, but even that can go wrong. Um, and we actually we look into the DNA. You find oh, not quite what we thought. Um, Somebody who travelled up from the Mediterranean, not quite the Celtic Scottish individual that somebody had thought, or somebody who ever made the model had thought. This map um, charts the progress of the people across Europe. Um, and it's sort of a series of maps. Maps are very useful, they're very, they're very visual. You can see immediately what's going on. Everyone understands a map. The grid. And this is one of the latest iterations of the idea of maps. Here's a much older one. Faces again, but very different faces. Um, the faces of goddesses. Um, Crawford. And, yeah, I, I love the way you said uh, uh, largely conjectural. You know, I, <laughs> <laughs> I just made it up. Um, <laughs> With, with prehistory, everything's largely conjectural. So he was he was looking at these little idols, these little face idols, the big eyes. Um, uh, 
the little uh, uh, plaques, uh, sometimes there's a little uh, cylinder there um, and uh, a bone down the bottom image there. Um, the bone one is, remember that one, it's um, significant. Um, and here's the very latest iteration of that map um, coming out of the steps. Um, and there's a little origin um, tail painting, um, the Hungarians. Um, this is the spread of Indo-Europeans across Europe. Amazingly, this is this, is this year, 2019, amazingly, you could, have, you could just substitute Rehagimitis' map from, you know, half a century ago. It's the same. The dates are actually very similar too, amazingly. Um, with her, yeah, and just replace, put, stick curtains in there, and it works. It absolutely works. Now, obviously, what, what, where I'm looking at is Ireland. That, that's the area I'm looking at. And it, it's, it's sort of, some of the area I didn't even bother having an arrow going into Ireland. You know, it's so far off to the west. Just, uh, whatever. So, but it's interesting. Ireland is, it, from a prehistoric point of view, from a material culture point of view, is interesting because of its isolation. Um, I, th I think there's less fluctuation. It's less prone to, 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 to sporadic influence. Um, so, so it does make an interesting case study. Sticking with Maria Gimbetus, she saw these, this, this, this huge movement of people <coughs> as effectively a regime change. <coughs> now, this has been, this has been validated. It's, it, it's been the, the DNA, the, 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 the isotope, everything else has basically, yeah, 90 percent you know, population replacement. I mean, that was the whole idea of. It, of course, the, you know, the, the, it was pots, not people. No, no, it was people. It was people with pots. There was a huge amount of movement. Um, so perhaps maybe worth revisiting some of her ideas. And really with the Indo-Europeans, was, it was regime change. It was fundamental. And the way she looked at that, the material evidence she used for that <clears throat> could be summarised basically. Um, the governance society... Uh, method of succession, uh, divinities, and, and, and what happened to people when they died. Um, and really, what she looked at was uh, the appearance of thrusting metal weapons. Okay, the, 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 these Indo-Europeans, they brought the Bronze Age, really, to wherever they went, um, and, and to Ireland. Well, this, this, this lovely guy here from uh, 1815, uh, I got into this by looking at the weapons. I, I, I studied the, the Bronze Age metal weapons, looking uh, at them, and uh, this is an interesting thing. They, these are real artifacts he's holding. These were things that the artists would have actually been able to study and see. Um, his, his spear is actually, is actually <coughs> not a spear at all. Um, it's one of these. It's a little Bronze Age dirk, uh, a little <coughs> dirk that he's just imagined incorrectly. I looked at lots and lots and lots of this stuff to try and find out had it been used fancy fancy in the past. Not really, I don't think so, but anyway, that's something else. What I did notice was a lot of ritual damage. Um, damage under the handle that could only be ritual. That doesn't happen in combat. That happens whenever the, the, the hilt is hacked off and not in a nice way, not, not, not carefully by a craftsman or you know somebody trying to repair it, it's whacked off with an ax. It leaves damage. Um, this, this, is a, this is a ritual thing, and there's repeated uh, uh, impact damages around the hilt. The, the hilt, the organic hilt, has been hacked off. It's been defleshed, effectively. Um, yeah, there's, there's, there was something going on there. That, that, but that's, that's really quite another story. The other thing that uh, Marie Gimbetus looked at was the disappearance of goddess figures. She built a lot on that. Um, and the replacement of goddesses with the, 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 the okay, here we have druids, okay, um, again using real artifacts incorrectly. Um, this, this, yeah, with, with but good fun. Um, but it was, it, it is interesting. I love, I love uh, uh, the antiquarian approach to prehistory and the way they saw things, the way it also gives you pause for thought. The way we are saying things could be just as silly. We don't know. Um, in 50 years, you know, oh, really? Did they think that? Um, so, tempting to laugh. Right, 
looking at the de- looking at the weapons, what I noticed was there was a bit of a correlation between decorated that pendant triangle thing that I showed you, and ritual damage. The pendant triangle thing is a, is a very Irish thing in in terms of Britain and Ireland. You see it a lot in the continent, but in Britain and Ireland, the pendant triangle thing is quite Irish. Um, even stuff that's in British museums, Museum of Scotland, yeah, up, up in Edinburgh, uh, um, stuff down in London, here in London. It's generally Irish, if you look at it, yeah, it's, it's pretty much Irish. The, sorry, just to go back there, yeah, really, that, that brought me to, to looking at where, where, did this, where did this pattern come from? What's, what's it about? Um, you look at it, you go, it's a beaker pattern. The triangle's beaker. Look at, look at the most common beaker stuff, the, the pottery. So looking at the pottery, these, the patterns here, it's, it's thought of as being just abstract, just patterns, not very pretty, just patterns on a pot. When you break it down, you can break it down to three core mo- motifs. This is ongoing, as I said, I think even in my abstract, they had four or something. It's three, there's actually just <coughs> three things that happen. Crescents, these are unusual. This is the late stuff. If you remember, the, 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 the encrusted urns were, were late in the series. Um, I think it, it, there's, there's simple, that's meant to be a filled in arc and, and, and nested um, arcs. Much more common, chevron, which can ha- appear in two ways, either horizontal or vertical. And finally, triangles. Oh, they love their triangles. <laughs> so they can be plain or filled, filled uh, hatched uh, um, or, 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 or punched. Stippled. And that's the vase urn. It's the earliest one. Um, there's also some motifs appear on the inside of some of these cinerary urns. So, by the way, cinerary urns, the reason why I went for cinerary urns as opposed to any other form of beaker pottery is because we know what this was used for. The, the food vessels, who knows? Um, we don't know. Um, some lipid studies and all the rest of it, you can, you can think what they might have been used for once, but these things had ashes in them. These were cinerary urns. We know what they were for. <coughs> Decoration on the inside is a bit odd. This, uh, <coughs> the, one of the, the, the internal base thing has been described as a wheel. They didn't have wheels like that, I don't think. They had solid block wheels, so it's not a wheel. Um, the other little ones there, they're, now they are in the bottom of food vessels, and they're described as cruciform. And I think, looking at the cross, is looking at the wrong thing. What you're looking at, if you see the, if you see the cross, it's one of those optical illusions. If you see the cross, you're actually looking at the background. The foreground is the triangles. The cross is just the background. So uh, the, the, these arts, what could they be? Right, they're the trickiest ones. Um, I looked at uh, um, some rock art, lots of it. Um, this almost a sine wave. Okay, that's time and motion. That's, 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 a cyclical thing, um, the spirals, it's about, t- it's about motion, it's about time. I thought it's, it's <coughs> celestial, it's about sun, moon, whatever, seasonal, something cyclical. And you see these motifs, not just on the pottery, but also on metalwork. Uh, Lunula, even the jet necklace, if you look closely at the, at the little uh, con- connectors there, you can see the, the, the triangle motif there again. So the triangles are everywhere. The lunula, it, it is celestial. It's, it's thought it to be lunar, obviously. And probably, I, I think probably is. But again, this persistent triangle and band motif, triangle and band. Um, again, this, what, what we looked at in the base there of, of the pottery, sometimes appears in gold. These gold artifacts are found associated with lunula and they're called sun discs. And again, I think that's a mistake. That's looking at the background, the cross, rather than the triangles. I think the triangles is the thing. And if actually, if you, this one here, the Scottish one, if you unroll it, the pattern, there you have it. You've got your band and triangle motif. Again, the same as the lunula. Um, and again, on uh, Bulla, it's the same thing. Triangle and band motif, again. And on axes and palaces, um, again, triangle and band. And there's a brilliant one. 
uh, Evans's collection that he, that he gave to the Ashmolean. It's got everything going on there. And so looking to see where, where, okay, where did this come from? Where did this motif come from? So looking across time and space. If you, if you start to look, I mean, yes, the, the map there we saw from Crawford was showing everything coming from the east. Okay. So, if, but if we actually do look at some stuff all the way across to, uh, uh, um, the Museum of Israel there has stuff. And again, if we look uh, band and triangle, big eyes, what's going on? Uh, tree, life, uh, tree of life goddess. Okay. Well, we see that there in this uh, Syrian and Palestinian mother goddess. The Egyptians really just love, they, they absorb everything apparently. They, they, they just thought, here, this is good, yeah, we'll have that. <laughs> um, but you know it's foreign, you know it's not Egyptian because it's not given it the, you know, the classic Egyptian pose, whatever. It's, it's a full front on, so it's a foreign goddess. The stuff this is associated with <coughs> is important. Okay, big eyes. That, that big hair, uh, the breast navel, hip girdle, pubic triangle. Okay, so the face that launched a thousand appendants. You can see the reductionism that's happening there. Um, it comes down to just symbolism. It just reduces from the full kit that we see on the left right down to just a couple of things conveying the meaning. It's, that's symbolism for you. So there are the key features. Do we see that anywhere else outside? Yeah, we find that this is, this is a fantastic site in northern Italy. Brilliant site. Going back to the Mesolithic. These are a couple of things they find. Neolithic, late Neolithic. And if you look at the goddess there on the right, by the Venus, as it's called it, um, it's got all the stuff. Now, could these things have got all the way around to say Ireland's as far out as you can get? Could that stuff have got across there? Well, maybe, but um, lions, no. Snakes, definitely no. <laughs> um, big taboo about people. Right across British Isles, people, no, don't do people. So get rid of the people. What are we left with? Not much. Well, we're going to have to reproduce this in metal and simplify it. These are the tools we have to use. What have we got? We've got this and ritual. What do you do with ritual? <coughs> you repeat, 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 repeat. And then you can rearrange it to whatever you like. And I think what we have here is the representation of plants, water, regeneration, and cyclicity. Okay, this, this is about fertility and regeneration. You can see it there in the ax. The ax was used for clearing forest. And God, they really <coughs> did clear Ireland. I mean, they cut everything down. And for regeneration. Okay, so it's a big fertility thing, the axe. And in death, same thing. Regeneration. Basically, the pot <coughs> is a womb. You're placing the person back into a mother figure, into the ground, another mother figure. And it's about regeneration. So the warrior thing of, I've, I've sort of written off, that's not really a, a thing. Um, fabulous book available downstairs, if you like. Um, it explains why the, the, war, the, the, the weapons weren't really weapons at all. Um, that questions the male dominated the patriarchy. That questions all of that. Once you take the weapons away from not being weapons, but being something else. Early Bronze Age. So, Ireland has no traditional goddess figures, but what it actually does have is a ubiquitous representation of a goddess in the shape of ceramics and metal and everything else. That whole girdle and triangle, it's, it's about mother goddess. It's about fertility and the pots effectively work as, as do the same job as Venus figures in their own way. Um, it, basically, it's right there. These things aren't abstract. 
Um, it's, it's down to, and this again, this is something I'm still working on. So, so it's very early days. Um, I stumbled into this. So yeah, so I, I, I think Marie Gimbert has got it very wrong, but for the right reasons, but missed something and actually disenfranchised women from prehistory when actually they're very central to it. And, and this would suggest that. Okay, thank you. <laughs>